Hi there, and welcome to this short presentation detailing my experience of building and improving the Academy 125th scale Jagd Panther. Without doubt one of the most formidable weapon systems of World War II, the Jagd Panther originated from an order of October 1942 for the development of an assault gun using the long 88mm Pac L71 mounted on a Panther chassis. The prototype was shown to Hitler in December 1943, with production starting in January 1944 and continuing until March 45. A total production of approximately 392 vehicles was paltry by the standards of the time and largely explains why, for all its qualities, the Jagd Panther had a limited impact on the battlefield. There's been some debate in sections of the modelling community as to whether the Academy kit is actually a straight reissue of the old Tamiya one or completely new in its own right. Being in the lucky position of having both kits, I can say the truth lies somewhere in the middle. At first glance, the two kits do appear identical, but on closer inspection, significant differences become apparent. The Tamiya has simplified individual track links designed to work, and consequently over scale, and requiring the drive sprocket to have an inaccurate number of teeth to enable this to happen. Academy correct this to some extent by providing thinner and more accurate vinyl track and with the correct number of teeth on the drive sprocket. The road wheels in the original Tamiya offering are also reworked by Academy and look much better as a result. For all the fact that Academy have improved on the original kit, we're still left with a kit that's essentially well over 40 years old. The niche scale is a problem because whereas modellers working in 135th have lots of aftermarket products available that can improve kits that are often very good in the first place, the 25th scale marketplace is very different. Some very helpful bits are available and I made use of them, but aftermarket products on their own will not bring this kit up to modern standard. Some good old DIY is needed too. The kit is very basic, but the standard of moulding and overall fit of parts is generally good. As with most AFV kits, construction begins with the lower hull, and here the first bit of extra work is needed, filling in the various slots and holes provided to accommodate the motorisation. Once done, the individual torsion bars are inserted, simply clipping into place very easily. Now, some major boxing in is necessary. Because if the kit is assembled unmodified, the interior lets in more daylight than the average greenhouse. The photos show the minimum that's required to alleviate this problem. Incidentally, it's a good idea to fit the back plate, part D29, before this work commences. Now comes the issue of interior detail. The kit has precisely none, so it's a question of just how much you want to do. The opening hatches do mean that a lot of the interior is visible, so a major scratch build would be worth the effort for anyone wanting to try it. I did a bit of a token effort. There's a resin Maybach engine available in the correct scale, and this saved some scratch building. To display it, the engine hatch cover needs to be removed. This is made easy by the deep groove moulded around its outline, so a bit of work with a pin sharp scriber and razor saw soon does the job. Whilst I was at it, I also added raised ventilation fan that's actually for the Panther kit, but featured on the museum example of the Jag Panther I was using as a reference. The gun breech is clearly visible through the loading hatch in particular, and as I had some good reference photos, I embarked on a bit of work that became a mini project in itself. The breech block's not easy to represent in plastic, so I milled one out of aluminium stock. The main length of the interior section of the gun was fashioned from a spent cartridge case, ironically from a 7.92 Mauser round, exactly the type fired from the MG42 of the real vehicle. The rest of the detail was added from brass and copper wire, PVC tubing, small nuts and bolts and plastic card. This all took a lot longer than I anticipated, but the final result looked okay. I used Arbor's etched brass front fenders and side rails. 
These need careful folding and shaping, which I didn't find easy, but the end results are much superior to the plastic representations provided in the kit, as you can see. These brass sets weren't available in the UK, incidentally. I had to do a bit of real searching to find them, and in the end I got them online from Poland. I believe a set of side skirts are also available in brass, but to be honest in this scale, if you wanted to include them, you could do it pretty easily from plastic card. Arbor's grills for the engine are very good, and include very well produced representations of the hexagonal fixing bolts. The grills are easy to fit, but the bolts are trickier, involving some careful folding, but it's worth the effort. I believe Arbor also do a generic set of German tools and clamps. I wasn't able to source any of these from anywhere, but the tool set would have been very useful if I could have got it. The range of finishing products used on the model are shown here. Don't there seem to be ever more of them? Years ago I never used to use primer, but now I find that without a primer coat, modern paints, enamels and particularly acrylics, just don't cover or adhere properly. So now I prime as a matter of course. Luckily the Holford's plastic primers come in a range of colours, not just grey, and are very reasonably priced. Once primed, there's some black pre-shading done before the camouflage scheme was applied. The overall sand yellow scheme comes next using the Dunkelgelb set from the Vallejo AFV painting system. The brown and then green patches were Tamiya XF52 and XF26 respectively. I wanted a fairly tight demarcation between the colours. Good way to achieve this is with a very thin mix, no more than one part paint to two parts thinner, and low pressure around about 10 psi. Applying the decals was a problem because the kit items are dreadful. No aftermarket options are available and considerable scavenging from the spares box was required to put together something that looked half decent. Once that job was done, everything was sealed with a couple of coats of the ubiquitous clear. I'm not much of a weatherer, but such was the size of this model that something had to be done to give it a bit more character. After an overall wash of brown from the Flory Models weathering set, I used the grime for a bit of extra effect around the engine deck. I then tried a new acquisition, namely the streaking effects set from AK Interactive. Three bottles in the set are streaking grime, rust streaks and winter streaking grime. They're all enamels intended to be applied and then streaked with a cotton swab dipped in thinners. They work well, although I didn't make heavy use of them. Another AK set is the engine and metal set, containing five jars this time, a mixture of washes, pigments and enamels. Three of the jars were specifically aimed at finishing tracks, but I was also able to use a bit of the other two. They are engine grime and engine oil. The latter was particularly interesting. It's a gloss enamel and it really does look like, well, fresh engine oil. The three track treatments are an overall wash and then two pigments. Once the wash was applied, dabs of the rust pigment were worked in, together with a bit of light mud mix from pastel chalks and turpentine. The steel pigment was used finally to highlight the tops of the cleats in contact with the road. The tracks on the model, you may have noticed, are not the ones provided in the kit. They're the separate link version provided by Tamiya, with some trimming of the teeth on the drive sprockets necessary to get them to fit. I accidentally destroyed the kit tracks by overheating them in an attempt to soften them before fitting. We all make mistakes. After the various tools are added, including tow cables fashioned from nylon twine, it was time for the base. This was made from a rough piece of mahogany from my local woodyard. I was going to do a nicely polished effort, but liked the rough version so much that I left it as it was. It had a bit of a trench art feel to it that matched the style of the model. The name plates were not nicely engraved brass items, but stamped copper pieces that I couldn't resist polishing, but will look better when they tarnish a bit with time. To conclude, I really enjoyed this project. I think whenever we start a model, we always have a vision of what we want the finished item to look like, don't we? 
This one came out almost exactly as I wanted, despite its obvious shortcomings. There's not much interior detail, despite what I have added, and there's also possibly one or two accuracy issues as well. But I like the extra sense of presence that these larger scale models have, and it's a shame that more of them aren't available. I believe this kit may still be in production, but you don't see many around. It's a shame because anyone who's a real armour specialist, unlike me, could build a real showstopper. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the show and found it useful, and I look forward to you joining me again in the future. Thank you.